let's talk about it. <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me the impression I get from lay people on the criterion that you folks use to compare one preacher to another. Although none of you are bold enough to say it, the impression that I get is that the number one consideration when comparing preachers is this. Is he boring? <laughs> because if he's boring, he's not a good preacher. If he's interesting, then he is a good preacher. Do we stay awake during his sermons? If we stay awake during his sermons, then he is a good preacher. If we fall asleep during his sermons, then he is a bad preacher. I knew a woman who had some kind of arm surgery where her arm needed to be fixed in a certain position in order for it to heal. So she had a pillow underneath her arm and she walked into church with a pillow and I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> Can I remember on Sunday afternoon what the preacher said Sunday morning? If I can remember on Sunday afternoon what the preacher said on Sunday morning, then he must be a good preacher. If on Sunday afternoon I cannot seem to recall what the preacher said that morning, then he must be a bad preacher. Now folks, I am not saying that these are considerations that you should just ignore, nor am I advocating amongst my brother pastors that they should preach boring sermons. It does not honor the word of God for the pastor to be boring in the pulpit. What I am saying is that you must take into consideration the criterion by which God judges his preachers. Listen to the word of the Lord from 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is God addressing the pastor at Ephesus named Timothy. God says to this pastor, watch your life and your doctrine closely. If you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. That means that the preacher who is truly a good preacher is one who keeps an eye on his life so that it is not offensive, and who keeps an eye on his doctrines. Not so much how does he say what he says, but what does he say? Does he preach you the scriptures? Does he preach you the apostolic doctrines? Does he preach you Jesus? Does he preach you everlasting salvation based upon the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or does he mysteriously avoid making mention of that? Because you know what, people? The preachers of the devil are also interesting. Jesus says, Beware of the false prophets, for they will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Do you really think that Satan will send forth preachers who are boring? No! He'll send preachers who are attractive. He will send preachers who have good oratory. He will send preachers to preach a message that is attractive to the human soul. And he will send forth preachers to gather around them thousands and thousands of followers. And he will preach them all straight into damnation. Beware of the false prophets. They look like true prophets. In fact, the book of Revelation, when it describes the second beast, says that it has the horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And it will have the power to call down fire from heaven. That is to say, that the false preachers will even be able to perform miracles that look like the prophet Elijah, who also called down fire from heaven. The false prophets and the true prophets will appear the same in their ability to perform miracles, in their oratory, in how interesting they are. The only way. To tell a true preacher from a false preacher is to consider what is it that the message he is bearing. Amen. What's he saying? Is he preaching to us Jesus Christ? Is he preaching us everlasting salvation based upon the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Does he tell us to repent of our sins? Does he forgive us of our sins in the name of Christ? The preacher who does this is bringing you the apostolic doctrines. The preacher who does this is preaching you the scriptures. 
The preacher who does this is preaching you Jesus, and he will preach you straight into heaven. Even if his oratory isn't so good. Even if he always isn't interesting every single last Sunday. This is why the book of James says not many of us should be teachers. Because those who teach will be judged more harshly. There is only one foundation that can be laid, and that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. And some preachers are going to build on that foundation with silver and gold. They are going to preach Jesus Christ. And the ones who listen to them will survive the judgment because they will be silver and gold built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. The fire will come and it will not harm. And some preachers will build with straw and with hay and with wood. Some preachers are afraid of offending their congregations. They're afraid of preaching something controversial. They avoid telling their congregations to repent. But if they don't tell their congregations to repent, neither will they be able to tell their congregations that they are forgiven. Lots of preachers like to preach armchair psychology from the pulpit, to preach the latest in counseling from the pulpit. Do you really want a non-expert preaching to you therapy from the pulpit? By the way, uh, beware of therapists who preach you spirituality from their uh, chair there. They're not trained in that either. Now, that's just an aside. And they'll preach you nice five or six easy steps to better living, five or six easy steps to more peaceful living, five or six easy steps to more prosperous living. And it's that more prosperous living that attracts all of us. What can I do with God to give him, or to get him to give me a few more things down here? And when you preach a prosperity gospel, you're not going to mention the cross of Jesus Christ. What's prosperous about the cross of Jesus Christ? You're not going to preach about the enmity of the world. What's prosperous about the enmity of the world? And they will avoid those subjects. And the fire will come. And if you are the wood, the hay, and the straw that is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, the fire will consume you. If the preacher happens to believe in Jesus, he might escape, but he will only escape as one escaping through flames. Okay, are we just at the mercy of preachers then? I mean, what if we get a bad one? What do we do with it? I mean, I would hope that if you came across a pastor who quit preaching to Jesus Christ, you'd take him aside and have a word with him, especially if it's me. You know, before you just out and out get rid of the guy, I would like you to have a word with him first. You know, Pastor, we haven't heard a lot about the death and resurrection of Jesus lately. We haven't heard a lot about forgiveness of our sins and everlasting salvation lately. Okay, that's true. You are also not at the mercy of God for another very important reason. Now, let's be careful. You, that is all of you, are God's temple. Got me? All of you are God's temple. Now, what does that mean? In the Old Testament, at Mount Sinai, God gave instructions to Moses for the construction of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was an elaborate tent that once the Israelites got it built, God made his dwelling place in the tabernacle. The Israelites camped around the tabernacle. They lived in their tents, God lived in his tent. In this way, God made his dwelling place on the earth among the Israelites. If you want more details on this, just ask the Wednesday morning adult Bible class. They are rapidly becoming experts on the subject. When King Solomon built the temple, the temple replaced the tabernacle. So God moved his presence out of the tent of the tabernacle and into the building that Solomon had built. The temple is therefore holy. It is sacred. If you defile the holiness of the temple, you will die. So in the book of Leviticus, Aaron's elder sons, Nadab and Abihu, go into the tabernacle and they offer unauthorized incense. 
In other words, they put incense into their censers, they go into the tabernacle, they burn that incense, but they burn it in a way that the Lord did not command them to burn it. And because they offered unauthorized incense in the holy presence of the Almighty God, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. Now, you may sit on the pew and ask yourself, well, what they do that was so wrong? And that is a legitimate question to ask. All they did that was wrong was they offered incense at a time or in a way that the Lord did not command them. And if you're sitting out there on the pew wondering what's so bad of that, you are asking a legitimate question. The only thing that is bad about that is that they were outside of the will of God in the presence of God. And when you are outside the will of God in the presence of God, the result is fire. You cannot defile the holy temple of God without being consumed by fire. Now, people, you are God's temple. You are God's temple. You are the dwelling place of God on this earth. There's no more temple in Jerusalem. The Romans burned it down hundreds of years ago. You are God's temple. Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And the Jews say, wow, it took 46 years to build this temple. Who do you think you are saying you will raise it again in three days? And then the disciples realized that the temple Jesus had spoken of was the temple of his body. And after Jesus rose from the dead, they realized that's what Jesus meant. So the body of Jesus is the temple. It's the place where God lives on earth. You are the body of Christ. The book of 1 Corinthians asserts both things. You, the Christian congregation, are God's temple. You, the Christian congregation, are the body of Christ. The Christian congregation is the place on earth where God lives. The place on earth where He puts His very presence. Jesus says, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. And here we are. Two or three of us are gathered. We begin the service in His name, and He is here in your midst. If a preacher defiles you, he will face fire. If a preacher preaches you falsehood, he will face fire. You are not at the mercy of your preachers. You are God's temple. You are the body of Christ. And God will defend your holiness with His eternal flames. So, people, I belong to you. You own me. God has called me to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, and as long as He has called me to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, I am yours. And while Pastor Padal was called to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, he was yours. And Pastor Jirovic before him, and Wackeltz before him, and then the order of pastors becomes a little fuzzy in my mind after this, but somewhere back there, there's a brute log and a kirkhoff. Okay? And they all belong to you. All of us belong to you. All things are yours, don't you understand? Do you know what Jesus has given to you by his death and resurrection? He has given you things present and things to come. The things present that Jesus has given to you is the promise of your everlasting salvation. And because your everlasting salvation takes the form of your resurrection from the dead and life in the world that is coming, He has also given you the things to come. And because Jesus has given you the things to come by giving you the resurrection, He has given you life and death. You have the office of the keys. Remember your catechism. What is the office of the keys? The office of the keys is that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20, The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven.
Folks, if you have the authority to forgive and not to forgive, then life and death are yours. And not just life and death in this world, life and death in the world to come. The politicians of this earth may think that they have the power of life and death, but they have the power of life and death only in this world, and after that their power ends. You have the power of life and death over all things. God is dwelling in, his, in your midst. You are His body, you are His temple. And if all these things belong to you, well then, Padal, and Kirkhoff, and Brutlog, and Wattles, and I also belong to you. We are yours. And you, you belong to Christ. You are Christ's. 